Okay. Uh, as I said this morning, one of the big efforts we're undertaking is to combine new research with synthesis. And uh, we've increasingly relied on and invited Adrian Finley to get involved in um, helping us move some of uh, that work and advance some of those directions. So he's going to talk about some of that work with the low ground track. I'm going to just tell you about three things that we're doing in the context of uh, the goals for the LTER5 uh, grant proposal, some things that we've done in the past, and some of the directions in which we're thinking about moving this forward. So uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of vignettes uh, and then do a third vignette, which is a little bit longer than the first two. But they're all sort of motivated by the same, the same basic issue here, and that is that you know, we depend on models to tell us something about how systems work, right? They're an, ex an expression of the current state of our understanding of how things work, and then we use those models to make predictions like the IPCC does. And those predictions probably have no value whatsoever, but they allow you to actually analyze the model. Well, right? we all know models do. And they, don't, they don't predict very well. Um, but they do tell you things about underlying processes, in particular when you start doing more standard comparisons, you begin to understand how different parameterizations of similar things actually may or may, or may not give you different answers. And in the case of they give you different answers, then there's something interesting to explore there, and that turns the model into a hypothesis generated tool, which is really very useful. Um, so this is just a general diagram of an ecosystem or a Earth system. A model. Uh, these are the things that are used in assessments like the IPCC. Uh, this happens to be the community plan model structure, which was used in uh, the fifth assessment report, which will come out next year at some point, I think. Uh, and basically, it's divided like this. It's a biophysical model. There's CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. That CO2 gets taken up through the process of photosynthesis, and it's allocated to uh, biomass. Uh, that's biomass above the ground. Um, some of that biomass turns over roots and enters a coarse woody debris pool. Um, that coarse woody debris pool is then decomposed uh, into uh, sort of organic matter, uh, stuff that you have in mineral soils. It's not identifiable as dragons anymore, but it's chock full of, of organic carbon molecules. And then there are actually some models that um, think about hydrogen as a component of, of their analysis. Most don't actually, which is a really um, important point. But um, but certainly um, a, a growing number of them do, the community land model being one of those. Uh, and that's important because we know that uh, we need nitrogen to support primary production. The most obvious manifestation of that is the role of nitrogen in, in photosynthesis through the production of the rubisco enzyme. Um, and I think there's a little bit of confusion, particularly in the carbon cycle science community, um, it's often argued that the trees get the nitrogen that they need, but that in fact isn't true. We have lots and lots and lots of experimental evidence to show that the trees get what they acquire, what they can get. Right? So the nitrogen imposes a constraint uh, on the carbon uptake. And the degree to which that constraint is manifested, more or less, say, depends on lots of things. It depends on the physical environment, but it also depends on uh, things related to carbon allocation, in particular, how much of the carbon that's fixed through the process of photosynthesis is allocated below ground, and how does that carbon allocation below ground influence the decomposition process and ultimately the uptake of the nitrogen that's used to drive photosynthesis uh, and food growth in the first place. So that's the, the context here, and I just want to zoom in on this uh, lower box because that lower box is the below ground stuff, and that's the stuff that we um, find very interesting, I guess. And, 
Um, here is that below ground box just sort of blown up for you a little bit. Um, you can see that there are these, uh, oops, come back. Oh, I gave away my <laughs> There are, there are three liver pools, okay, so this is like the, the organic horizon, the waves, the parameters, and all that stuff. And then there are three sort of organic matter pools, and this is the carbon that's in, in the middle of soil. And basically the way that these models work is that they define a, a temperature effect on the decomposition process. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an exponential effect, increases in temperature, increased decomposition rates. And then you release some CO2 based on the chemistry of the carbon in these different pools, and then you move carbon from a litter pool to a solar organic matter pool or among the different solar organic matter pools. And this is a very a neat and tidy representation of a major process in an ecosystem, which is decomposition. Um, it works well. You can get these models to spin out the right numbers. Right? So why would you worry about this at all? Why bother? Well, the answer is that we think that these models really aren't sufficiently rooted in the, me the mechanisms of decomposition that we can really trust what they're telling us in terms of the response of ecosystems to climate and atmospheric change. Uh, and in particular, they don't do anything with the organisms that are actually responsible for the process of decomposition, which are microorganisms, bacteria, and fungi that live in the soil. There isn't a single one in here, right? And beyond that, well, no microbes. We know that there are changes in physiology with temperature for microbes. Mm -hmm. And we know that the microbes produce enzymes that they either lop onto the outside of their cell or release into the soil environment to actually decompose those organic materials. And they're a critical component of the decomposition process, also um, not incorporated in these very traditional models um, that, that date back to the 1980s, essentially. Uh, and then we have all this evidence about microbes on decomposition, and they're, they're not even close to being found in these models, particularly the effects of uh, carbon allocation to mycorrhizal fungi, these symbiotic fungi that live on plant roots, and even things like the fact that roots release carbon into the soil but in a way that cheat the microbes of the nutrients that they might release when they're decomposing soil organic matter. So the funny thing that I think is going on is that we're kind of stuck in the 1980s, and it's not great. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> you don't want to move beyond this phase of anything about entering the 21st century. And the way that you're going to do that is by saying, this is a great modeling framework, but is there a better way to do it uh, out there? And I think that the answer is yes. Actually, model the things that do the decomposition and study those things. So that's sort of what we've been up to. And uh, Harvard Forest has played a really important role. Uh, we've done a lot of our research here to help us um, understand these things. So, um, I'm going to just have these three vignettes. Um, you know, how do we do better? Well, we can do data synthesis. And I'm going to talk about place-based uh, research, which has to do with the soil respiration database that many of you contributed to, and, and Aaron, I guess, kind of collated it all and got it all coherent. Uh, looking at just some patterns of soil respiration, comparing them to ecosystem respiration to take on a, a topic that is oftentimes controversial, but I think we have a much better understanding of it today. Uh, talk a little bit about a literature synthesis activity that looks specifically, specifically at plant controls on decomposition. Uh, and in particular, extrapolating very fine spatial and temporal scale processes that are occurring in the rhizosphere, which is this zone of soil uh, immediately around roots, to the ecosystem scale, which is kind of fun. Uh, who knows if it's right, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that you're trying when you're developing hypotheses. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the new research that we're doing here that's coupling modeling with, uh, with uh, experiments that are being done here at Carson Forum. So um, the first one is going to seem like a wild detour out of the main focus of this talk, which is essentially plant controls on decomposition. But since it's of interest to this community, I thought I'd at least show um, a figure uh, from uh, this Harvard Forest synthesis activity. So um, uh, basically, what it turns out is that everybody and their grandmother has been measuring soil respiration in a hard forest. So we got these rules of data. <laughs> no one's ever done it in comparison. And, uh, and so we thought, well, that would be nice. And, and Aaron and David and, and Eric Davidson and so on were kind enough to say, go for it. So we did. And this is work primarily done by, by my technician, Mark uh, Andres Yassault. And uh, what you're looking at here are um, Sort of long-term series of soil respiration. Oops. Soil respiration in red here. 
and then uh, and and this is respiration that we both measure and predict for the, the area around the EMS tower. And then the black line here is the eddy covariance estimate of ecosystem respiration. And this <coughs> panel here is showing you the number of different studies with data that enable us to uh, estimate uh, soil respiration. And this is from 1992 to 2010. So in the early 1990s, there was only one study that was measuring uh, soil respiration out of the Harvard Forest. In the late 1990s through the 2000s, right, there were between five and 10 or 12 different types of studies, experiments or observational data that were being collected. Uh, and that number has gone down a little bit uh, in more recent years, though. I think it's slated to go back up. And basically, this, um, these two records right here reflect um, synthesis of tens of thousands of data points. Each one of these studies will collect data uh, if it's an auto chamber every few seconds. You know, uh, it's a manual sampling, maybe a few, you know, a couple dozen times throughout the year, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is a huge amount of data that we can come uh, to, to bring to bear on a, on a really interesting question. And that interesting question could be, for example, what's the phenology of above ground versus below ground respiration out of our forest? Um, that would be interesting to know because the phenology of below ground respiration relates very directly to the activity of roots process. So um, what we've done is essentially take this 20-year record, which is both measured and modeled. We do cap filling. Uh, we use uh, uh, temperature uh, kind of respiration functions to, to essentially create a 20-year record. And then we've just taken the average of those 20 years of data here. Okay. And so what you're looking at down here is the carbon flux rate in grams of carbon per meter squared per day of uh, ecosystem respiration, which is this black line here in the EMS tower, and then uh, soil respiration, which is in this purple and red line here. And the difference in the distance between the black line and the purple slash red line is an estimate of above ground respiration. Total ecosystem respiration and total below ground, the difference of those two is presumably some estimate of above ground respiration. And it's a really interesting pattern for this sort of uh, red oak, uh, red maple, and uh, sort of dominated footprint. And that is that um, you can see the effects of snow cover here. Uh, these gray hashed areas are periods when there's snow cover and the fossils are pretty low. Um, we don't really have any snowpack estimates of soil respiration, so this is normal just to indicate that uh, it's completely, um, it's made up of zero real data points, but we just went ahead and made the estimations from the other temperature functions that we have. It's kind of the best we can do. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's okay. Anyway, the fluxes are low, but you can sort of see as the snowpack goes, and all of a sudden, all the fluxes go up, right? Which is not surprising. Um, but one of the interesting things is that as ecosystem respiration rises all the way from bud burst through about leaf out, right? You can see that this back calculated above ground respiration line uh, increases in concert with that initial increase in ecosystem respiration. But there's a bit of a lag in the soil respiration. And as you proceed through the growing season, at least for the red oak and red maple sites uh, in the EMS tower, uh, the above ground, uh, well, I should say the total soil respiration begins to increase and increases very, very high. And it almost reaches the level of ecosystem respiration. And so the difference between those two lines collapses down to zero. And what, that's, what that is suggesting is that once the uh, first flushes of twigs and leaves have been produced, right? Uh, there is very little above ground respiration. It stays pretty low until perhaps later in the year when the leaves start changing color and the process of abscission increases, right? And so you're expending metabolic energy to abscise those leaves. Um, there's been a long standing debate as to whether or not um, you can actually map soil respiration data onto ecosystem respiration data from eddy covariance towers. And uh, the Harvard Forest, I think, because of the virtue of all the soil respiration data that are available to it, uh, is in a good position to address this particular issue. And I know that, that Steve Wofsey's group and Bill Hunter's group uh, you know, have, uh, have spoken uh, about this particular issue uh, on a number of occasions. But what we did was to actually use um, uh, GIS maps of vegetation type within the hemlock tower footprint and then use all the soil respiration data that we have available to us for those vegetation types to essentially create a weighted average soil respiration uh, uh, 
a number. And so we think that this is probably the best approximation that's out there in terms of thinking about uh, linking soil respiration with ecosystem respiration and say we're hoping about the chronology of what's happening above ground in terms of carbon loss versus uh, below ground. So it's, a, it's an interesting exercise. And, We've done the same thing for the Hemlock Tower. Uh, not quite as much data, but we're for the Hemlock Tower. And, and so there's more variance when you look at it as a, as a sort of average year. The same basic patterns apply, though the phenology is a little bit different between the partitioning between above and below the ground uh, phenology. The above ground respiration seems to, to map into the uh, growing season a little bit further. So just some interesting. Just some interesting observations, and I think one of the, the things that we can do with, the, with the, all the data that we've been collected here. And I think that one day, I hope this is up nice because it's so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but really, so that's vignette number one. Vignette number two is um, an analysis of trying to understand how plants control the decomposition process. And we see this rhizosphere, this very narrow zone of soil around roots has been a major driver of the decomposition. Process. And, the, and the mechanism is pretty straightforward, you know, to a first approximation, and, and yes, there are many exceptions, of course. Um, plants uh, allocate carbon below ground to produce roots. As those roots are growing, some carbon is released into the soil, and then there's also direct inputs of carbon from roots into the soil. And those carbon sources are really important from a microbial perspective, because microbes are heterotrophs. They use that carbon. They grow in biomass, and that creates demand for more nutrients and they release enzymes, and then they decompose the organic matter to get the nutrients back out. But of course, a root will live much longer than a microbial cell, particularly a bacterial cell. And so as that bacterial cell sort of turns it over, well, the root's in a position to take up the nutrients that was in that bacterial cell. So arguably, this is plants <coughs> tweaking the microbes to get the nutrients that they would like to get out of the system. And how effective they are at doing that depends on a whole host of things not the least of which is the type of microbial community that's there, the chemistry of the organic materials that the microbes can decompose, and so on and so forth. So that's a very um, uh, complicated set of processes to understand completely and thoroughly, but we can pick out some of the main features of that interaction and, and, and look at that and, and try to understand how important that might be, say, to um, the soil respiration term that we just looked at for Forest. So, um, Kim Spiller, who was an undergraduate student at BU, who is now a technician in my lab, um, got new glasses after staring at over a thousand papers, uh, looking for activities of soil microorganisms in the rhizosphere, and comparing the activity of these microorganisms in the rhizosphere to the activity of microorganisms in bulk soil. And by bulk soil, I'm just referring to soil that hasn't been recently influenced by root growth or, or an excavation. And if you just look at this top left panel here, um, we're using a meta-analytic framework, so you, you calculate a response ratio. So in this case, it would be, for example, um, the size of the microbial biomass pool in the rhizosphere soil divided by the bulk soil. So, and then you take the natural log of that. So any values greater than zero indicate uh, greater activity or biomass in the rhizosphere soil. And when you're looking at all of these different types of things that microbes do, uh, their, their biomass growth, their respiration, the activity of the enzymes that they produce and release into the soil, um, the turnover of nitrogen that they acquire into inorganic forms, whether you're looking at net flux or a gross flux, or if you're looking particularly at the production of nitrate, all of these things in the rhizosphere are significantly enhanced relative to what they are in the bulk soil. So we can say that the rhizosphere is a, is a biogeochemical hotspot. Now, the thing about this kind of analysis is that these measurements all represent very short-term uh, entities. You measure a respiration, say, of a microbial population by destructively going out, collecting a root, shaking the root from the soil, and then all the little soil particles that stick to that root, you crumble them into a jar, then you cap your jar, and you measure CO2 production for some period of time. So that's obviously um, very destructive. Uh, which means that your sample by nature is short term, right? You don't, you don't have any possibility of doing this over and over in the same place. So it becomes a little bit of a challenge then to think about, well, how, how do I take these values and convert them into something that one of these biogeochemical models might actually be interested in? And the answer is you just make it all up. Because at the end of the day, if you talk to a model, they make all kinds of 
kinds of things up. <laughs> <laughs> it's really true. <laughs> so I'm an empiricist, and I was trained to be to be fidelitous to my data. So I am fidelitous to my data, but I'm starting to make more assumptions because it's really fun. <laughs> whole summer um, with an introduction to our book. In about four to six months, you can program an R books. What I did last summer. And you can begin to make models. And here's a model. <laughs> so what we did was to think about, well, what would we need to do in order to understand the, you know, the potential importance of these rise and sphere processes for, for decomposition? Well, you know, we took it pretty simple and pretty straightforward. We said, well, we need to know where the roots are distributed in the soil. So you can look at this as the cumulative root depth distribution. There are relatively few roots down in a meter, and as you go up and up and up in the soil, eventually you hit all the roots in that overlying meter of soil. And there's all kinds of information on things like fine root length, and you can distribute that fine root length across the depth of the soil as well. And that's important because we know that there are changes in soil organic matter chemistry as you go down the soil profile. The top is typically more labile materials, which means that they're easier to decompose and they generate more nutrients available for microbial growth. And as you go down, those materials get uh, typically a little bit older, typically a little more recalcitrant, although there's a lot of data on that. But at least less accessible, shall we say. And so you might expect that the rise of sphere phenomenon is not as important as that. The next thing that you need to do is think a little bit about root architecture, right? We know that not all roots exude the same amount of carbon. Uh, fine roots, the ones that are really actively growing, are exuding a lot by virtue of the fact that you have to lubricate the soil as the meristem of the root grows through the soil, otherwise the meristem would be a great, uh, would be torn apart, basically, it's like growing through sandpaper. Uh, as well as those are the most active in nutrient uptake. So that's where you see, typically, the greatest amount of exudation in the trickery in the microbial populations. So not only do you have to know where the roots are and their total length, but you need to know what their diameter distribution is. And this is one of the paper published by Kurt Fregitzer back in 2002, looking at root architectures for non-North American forests. And it turns out that about 75% uh, of the roots that are in these forests uh, have a diameter of 0.5 millimeters or less, which is extremely fine. Then what you have to do is fabricate things. <laughs> And you fabricate things based on your intuition and your reading of the literature. That's how it goes. When you don't really have any data on a particular entity that you need to know about. This is where models, I mean, all models do this, right? So what we thought was that, well, we know that the exudation, and there's enough literature support to tell us that exudation rates are going to go down as the diameter of the root increases. As the diameter increases, they get progressively woodier and they become not nutrient absorptive, they become you know, structures for yet more root growth and so on and so forth. So we didn't really have any data to go on. Um, so we just made three different assumptions with this idea that this uh, solid line in the middle here is our sort of best estimate but conservative assumption about the distance that these exodus are going to travel from the root surface. That is, how big the rise of sphere volume is going to be. Um, this is a picture, uh, sorry, this is a data of the distribution of radio labeled carbon in all types of agricultural plants uh, as a function of distance from the root. So you can see that all our plots, uh, even our most generous estimate, is lower than what they found here in the agricultural plants. And for a number of other uh, types of vegetation, primarily herbaceous, not so much woody. Um, there are reports of rises here extending anywhere between 3 and 12 millimeters from the root surface. They don't describe it in terms of the root architecture or anything like that. They just say, we found a labeled compound up to 12 centimeters. So this, at least to me, says that we're, we're in the right ballpark. And, uh, and hopefully this means that we're not um, overselling what could be happening in the rise. So now, uh, so it's not really, but there are two key data, right? not totally fabricated, but it's, it's, it is based on intuition. You always have to be guarded against that. Um, then we can begin to make some calculations. Well, what exactly is the rhizosphere volume of soil down to a meter's depth? And I'm not sure that any of you can read that. I'm not sure I can read that. But, um, <laughs> but you can, the, the scale here is from 0 to 6,000. Um, and this is just the prediction of the amount of rhizosphere soil in one centimeter layers you know, as you go down to a meter of depth. So, in a one centimeter depth meter squared plot, there are 10,000 centimeters squared 
of um, or 10,000 cubic centimeters of volume. So that you can see that at, at some depths, anywhere between you know 20 and then 40, and, and, and depending on how far the exudates go, 60% of the soil is in a quote unquote rhizosphere state, which is quite a bit of soil if you think about it. Um, and then if you think about integrating the data actually on the area basically under this curve, uh, not just looking at individual one centimeter thick slices, under our best estimate, we estimate that the top 30 centimeters of soil is uh, about 25% of the top 30 centimeters of soils in the horizon superior state. And that's not inconsequential because we know that microbial activity in the horizon is a good chunk higher than it is in. Are you standing because I'm running out of time? That's not inconsequential because we know from the meta analysis that the, the microbial activities in the horizon are much higher than they are in the bulk soil. So you can take your model and just sort of assume two states in the soil. One is your horizosphere state, and the other one is your non-horizosphere state. And you just sort of say, for a point in time, what fraction of, say, all the CO2 that's being released back to the atmosphere due to heterotrophic activity, this is the decomposition process, is accounted for by what's happening in the horizosphere. And um, here are some model values. Uh, the top left panel is just a distribution of the rhizosphere respiration rate uh, in terms of micrograms of carbon per meter squared per hour as you go down through the soil profile. And it shares a very similar pattern to the rhizosphere volume. You're just multiplying that volume by a constant. And then this is the uh, respiration rate in the bulk soil as you go down in depth. And one thing that we did was just to create a multiplier that decreases the quantity or the quality of the carbon as you go down in depth because in general decomposition goes down as you go down deeper in the soil profile. And what you're seeing here, these little excursions here, correspond to these blips here in the rhizosphere respiration. So then you can ask again the question, what fraction of the total respiration due to decomposition is coming from the rhizosphere? That's this plot over here. So this is rhizosphere respiration as a percentage of total soil respiration. And you can see that the rhizosphere potentially makes very large contributions, particularly in surface soils somewhere on the order of maybe 20 to 30 to 35 percent of all the respiration is coming from this very small zone of soil immediately around the roots. The way that we calculated all of these things is to use the results of the meta-analysis that I showed you earlier. We're looking at rates of microbial respiration in rhizosphere soil versus soil. And when you look at the nitrogen mineralization data, as just a second example, it turns out that the proportional stimulation in nitrogen mineralization in the rhizosphere uh, compared to bulk is about the same as it is for microbial respiration. So you can again sort of see that somewhere on the order of maybe 30% of the nitrogen that's mineralized at any one point in time may be derived from what's happening in the rhizosphere. So why is this really all that important? Well, it's important because what we really want to be doing is to read the literature and use modern understanding of how microbial processes affect the decomposition process in the big model. And it's very difficult to convince the big model people that they might want to do it differently. So we're going to do it ourselves. Um, you know, we talk to them and they're like, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so here is an example of, of what you might want to do differently. Um, you'll notice that the structure of this soil biogeochemistry model is very different from the model that I showed you for the community land model. Right? I don't have three pools and all that stuff. Maybe eventually we will. But what you do see in this is that there is carbon and nitrogen in the system, that that carbon and nitrogen has to be enzymatically degraded into soluble pools. And it's those soluble pools that the microorganisms can take up. And those, that uptake is driven by principles of kinetics, like my house and kinetics, you know, increases in uptake, but increases in concentration up to a plateau, the stuff that you learn in, in like eighth grade or something. Uh, and, and you then talk, do something about microbial physiology, okay? in particular thinking about things like carbon sufficiency, how does temperature affect basal metabolic rates, and what does that change in basal metabolic rate mean in terms of, of the ability to say, for example, synthesize enzymes that would ultimately be required to decompose the organic matter in the first place. So, this model structure basically is taking some information from a paper that Eric Davidson just published in Global Change Biology late last year. It's called the Dual Arrhenius 
like how is the model for enzyme uh, kinetics, or it's got a great acronym, DAM. And this is a modification here of uh, a nice uh, model by Schimmel and Weintraub that was simplified by Steve Allison. He had a paper in 2010 in Nature Geoscience looking in particular at the effects of carbon use efficiency on, on uh, uh, soil organic matter cool sizes. So I've run out of time, uh, unfortunately, but I will just finish by saying this, that this kind of framework, I think, has a lot more appeal from a modeling perspective, because what we're modeling are the processes that control decomposition, and we can characterize, for example, their temperature sensitivity response and their response to soil moisture. And in my mind, instead of modeling a phenomenon like a Q10, I'm modeling a process. And when you model processes, typically the outcomes are more meaningful and I would argue more accurate, at least for closer right reasons. It's not exactly the right reasons, but you're getting right so this is where we're going, uh, and we're going to spend a lot of time out here at the Harvard Forest uh, messing around with a few things. So I'll just plug in some work that my postdoc, John Drake, has done. This is a nice model. Um, <laughs> but we have this kind of fun uh, rhizosphere simulator focus that we put out in the forest last year, where we're actually pumping in um, carbon and, and nitrogen uh, into the soil to kind of simulate the rhizosphere, and then um, you know, making measurements of all different kinds of microbial processes. And this kind of information, seasonally resolved and, and so on, will help us parameterize uh, that model that I uh, showed you just a little bit earlier. So that's sort of where we're headed, and uh, I guess I'll have to stop there. Thanks. Thank you. That was a fabulous job of taking a day long seminar and setting it in. Are there quick questions? Uh, like the grazers? I don't know, like something that shreds a leaf to make it easier for a micro yeah. Yes. Or a grazer, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. you do. A yeah, mother yeah. kingdom. Sure. So there are grazers, right? Like sour grazers. Uh, big component of organic rises, and there's new. And then there's also freeze thaw. It's amazing.